And welcome everyone to co-production in a super diverse city with us here at Birmingham, uh, Age and Better in Birmingham. We're really excited that you've joined today and so thank you for that and we hope you will learn something useful from our experiences. So as Vicky said, uh, this webinar is part of the Stronger Together Festival of Co-Production Learning hosted by Age and Better. Uh, and my name is Alina and I work as part of the Age and Better in Birmingham team. And uh, Age and Better in Birmingham is one of 14 areas across the country that aims to develop creative ways for people over 50 to be actively involved in their local communities. So in Birmingham, our programme is delivered by a partnership of voluntary and community sector organisations led by Birmingham Voluntary Service Council. And today we are exploring how Aging Better in Birmingham was co-produced and co-delivered with all the people in this super diverse city. We will be sharing our thoughts and experiences on this subject. And it may not be relevant to where you work, as we know that a tailored approach works best to fit your local community and that's the best way forward. But we do hope that you'll find some parts that are really useful for, for you today. So just a little bit about the format today. We will start with a presentation uh, about the diversity of the environment in which we're working in Birmingham and the ways in which we sought to create an inclusive environment. And we'll then have a panel discussion talking about what went well and the challenges that we sought and the barriers that we discovered and how we overcame them. We will finish with a Q&A today. So if you have any questions at all, please either hold on to them until the end, or you can post them to our panelists by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, you can raise your hand by clicking on reactions and raise the hand. And I will then make sure that I unmute you and you will be able to have a chance to speak when the time comes. So without further ado, let me introduce Dave Coffin, my colleague from Birmingham. So then, yes, yeah, so um, I'm Dave Coffin and I'm a relationship manager at Aging Better in Birmingham. And this presentation will just give you a brief overview um, of the programme in Birmingham and how we approached its design and delivery in this super diverse environment. Okay. So as Alina said, so Aging Better is part of the national Aging Better programme and the approach here in Birmingham, um, one second. The approach here in Birmingham emphasised mutual aid, community action and preventative interventions and was delivered in partnership with a range of organisations from the city and led by Birmingham Voluntary Service Council. Uh, we used a methodology called Asset Based Community Development or ABCD, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and that focuses on sustainable development of communities based on their strengths and potentials. So what's strong about them rather than what's wrong? rather than focusing on, on the deficits. So over the seven years of the programme, or six years, we're into our seventh year now, um, groups have supported over 9,000 citizens of all ages across the city, um, and activities that those grassroots groups have put on have ranged from bicycle clubs, coffee mornings, ballet and bangra dance classes, woodworking, floristry, men's sheds, and also quite a few allotment plots were taken over as well, which is great, so gardening. The programme has supported the creation of over 280 new activities to date. Okay, so a little bit about Birmingham. So Birmingham is a diverse place. Its population is about 1.2 million. And outside of London, it's uh, considered the most diverse city in the UK. Um, put simply, Birmingham is a city of migrants. Um, and obviously there are recent migrations and also longer established minority populations. And the city is home to people from an estimated 200 countries. And that's the present day. Um, its communities and neighborhoods are dynamic, complex and culturally diverse. Um, it's also the youngest major city in Europe with under 25s accounting for around 40% of the population. So it has more people in the younger age groups than in the older age groups um, compared to the England average. Um, just something about those over 65, 30% of the over 65 live alone, which is an increased risk of social isolation. And uh, one of the most important things about the city is that significant wealth and income disparities. It's in the top 10% of the country when it comes to pension and poverty. Uh, an estimated 25,000 people over 60 plus experience income deprivation. So that's kind of the city in a nutshell. It's very diverse, very complex, and obviously a, a very complex environment to, to deliver any kind of project in. So just we said we'd give you some kind of insights into how we approach. So one of the key things was to understand the environment you're going to be working in. 
um, or you're going to deliver a project in. So as we say, it's a complex and diverse environment. So one of the first things we did was commission research um, by the Aston Research Centre for Healthy Aging at Aston University. And this was to help us better understand the localised root causes of social isolation so we could better allocate resources to achieve the most impact. So from that mapping and analysis, which is one of the first things we did, we determined that while the project could and should be delivered um, across the city, um, there should also be some targeted interventions as well. So we uh, have worked with communities of interest, communities of identity and two geographic communities. So that would be older carers. Uh, the LGBT community. Tyburn would be an outer city area um, with a high, po high population over 80 and Sparkbrook would be an inner city area uh, which is multi-ethnic so there are language barriers and cultural differences which increase risk of social isolation. So, so key takeaway there, understand the environment you're going to work in. Okay, um, next thing, partnership. As Alina said and alluded to, the, this uh, program has been delivered in partnership um, and the reason was to ensure that um, the organisations we work with were trusted and understood by the communities we were going to work with, ensure the programmes immediately embedded within those communities. Um, and I think that's really, really important um, to develop collaborative working. Um, next slide, what we delivered. So just in a nutshell, there were seven key strands of activity and all of it was designed um, to reduce social isolation for the over 50s. A big emphasis was on that kind of grassroots um, community led activity. So that would be the Aging Better Networks. They were supported by network enablers, which were those community organisations that were embedded in communities. Um, a service directory kind of communicated, which is a kind of social prescribing portal, communicated that activity out to the wider community. And the Aging Better Fund was micro investments into those grassroots activities. So that's kind of the grassroots or community facing activity. We also then had local um, area, local action plans, which were strategic targeted interventions, which were designed again to look at those root causes of social isolation and tackle those and lead to kind of service change. And empowerment and support was the um, co-production element, which we'll talk about more broadly in a minute. And then evaluation and learning is where we communicated out again, uh, particularly targeting kind of um, strategic bodies, public bodies, uh, funders about the learning that we got from the work we were doing. So again, they could look at how they approach um, delivering services within communities. Okay, so co-production. So where does co-production fit into this? So from its inception, Aging Better in Birmingham worked with partner organisations whose, benef whose beneficiaries reflected the diverse city's diversity. We recruited older adults to co-produce the programme through those partners. And that ensured that the programme was very, you know, responded to and understood the needs of the communities it was working in. Um, the group of older people had lived experience of social isolation. Um, we supported them to engage through a tailored programme empowerment called every step of the way. So just give you a quick overview of how co-produce this program's been. You see that organogram there, which is kind of the program, um, and all the people were involved in every aspect of delivery and governance. So they're on the governance group, the core partnership. They were influential in influencing um, the le learning and sharing and um, marketing and, and promotional activity through, through being set on subgroups. Um, obviously, they were involved in delivering activity on the ground um, and also involved in things like staff recruitment, procurement. So literally, all the people were represented at every level of this program from governance to delivery. Um, which is really, really good. So some of the challenges we, we faced in ensuring that diverse voices, diverse voices co-produce the programme. So the, um, I'll just talk through some of them in a minute. Um, the challenges weren't just confined to enabling access to those um, um, who may have characteristics protected under the Equality Act, but also included broader issues such as skills um, and poverty. So I'll just talk through four general things we came across and then obviously we'll go into our discussion. So just general recruitment. So when um, the Every Step of the Way uh, group was set up at the start of the programme, so about three or four years ago now, um, we struggled to engage with a multi-ethnic group of experts. Um, that truly reflected the city we were working in. Um, so while members were often from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, they, again, it was predominantly white British membership. So what we did straight away is started to work with our partner organisations to understand what the barriers were to people accessing the group or participating in the group and um, talk to them about how they approach recruiting members. Um, and as you'll see, uh, the group now broadly reflects the diversity of the city. 
Um, one of the challenges we came across, one of the areas of work in is Spark Rock, and um, it's a um, inner city suburb with a high proportion of the population would be Pakistani Muslim um, origin. And people, we had a, a, a lack of people from that hub, from that uh, suburb joining the um, Age of Experience group, the co-production group. Uh, when we dug into that, we found that people in that community were, particularly older people in that community, were very hesitant about working with organisations from outside of the um, community and very, very um, reluctant to leave um, the suburb to go and participate in activity. So the way we got around that, we addressed the issue by kind of creating a mini Age of Experience group um, specific to members of that community that fed into the main group. Now that isn't always ideal, but it did get those voices into the conversation. Um, okay, skills, um, another um, barrier that we had to address. So as I said, um, co-production members were engaged at all levels of activity, including in some quite technical processes. So recruitment um, panels, uh, procurement panels, again, very, very technical. So. Um, in the initial cohort, we realised that there were only one or two people that had those skills already to be able to engage in that process. But that wasn't fair because everybody should be able to engage in those processes. So there was a tailored programme of training and support to ensure everybody that wanted to could participate in those, those kind of processes. Um, and then ongoing mentoring as well, so people weren't just thrown in the deep and they were supported every step of the way to engage in the process. Um, and then finally, uh, as I say, Birmingham's got some horrendous pockets of deprivation, um, including in some of the priority areas we were working in. So every step of the way and the age of experience group are adequately, adequately resourced, both through um, a contract to facilitate the group, but also with um, funding to ensure the out-of-pocket expenses, uh, so taxi services to uh, meetings are covered, printing, ink, those sorts of things. Um, lunches are put on as well, so nobody should feel they can't participate because they haven't got the money to. And I think that's really, really important. And that isn't done in a stigmatising way or a kind of, you know, um, identifying who, who's, who, who's in poverty. It's just, it's put on for everybody so everyone can participate. Okay, so just the key takeaways really from, from that presentation in summary. So research and understanding the environment you're going to work in is really, really important develop community-based partnerships so you can really dig into the communities you're going to work with, um, co-produce at all levels and make sure it's resourced so everyone that wants to participate can participate where they want to, um, and be flexible and adaptive in how you approach the delivery of your projects. Um, if, the, if something's not working, change it. If something's not working, try something different and listen to the people you're working with because they'll tell you why it's not working. Um, so that's kind of that in a nutshell, and I hope that kind of gives you some context to the broader conversation we're going to have in a minute. Um, so for more information and learning on Aging Better in Birmingham, you can visit our website, which is agingbetterinbirmingham.co.uk, and I'll drop that into the chat now, so you've all got it. Um, and that is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for that. Um, so we will now move on to a discussion where panel members will share their experience around challenges, the barriers that they've discovered and what solutions worked for our programme here in Birmingham. And like I said at the beginning, we will finish with a Q&A session today. So if you have any questions at all, please post them to our panel by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you don't know how to do that, you can raise your hand by clicking on reactions and raise hand. And I will ask you to speak when the time comes. I'll be able to unmute you to do that. So on the panel today, we have some great, great people. We've got Hannah Webb, Network Enabler at our Citywide Hub, which is led by HUK Birmingham. We've got Angela Richards, member of our co-production cohort, the Age of Experience group. Um, you know, that's our experts by experience, basically. And then we've got Sam Julius. She is the project coordinator at Groundwork West Midlands, and she leads our Birmingham work around the experts by experience. And of course, Dave, which you've just met, um, he's the relationship manager for Agent Better in Birmingham. So the first discussion topic for you is thinking about why co-production is important. And Sam, I think you've got something to tell us about that. Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, so from my point of view, I think co-production, it ensures that people who are affected by the decisions have been involved in the process. Um, and in my personal experience, that makes for more fruitful and sustainable outcomes. 
people are more invested when their views and opinions have been listened to and that motivates them as well um, to, to be part of something. Um, when we ask the age of experience group, which we do often, um, you know, why are you, why did you want to join the group? Why are you still involved in the group? Because we're really proud that we've had members for years. Once people join the group, they do tend to stay with us. Um, so we often ask why that is, that they still continue to be, want to be part of the group. And quite often the answer is because they feel valued and listened to. Um, that's a really common reason um, and a really good motivating factor. Um, also, co-producing with people with lived experience as a professional, it's a good check as well, really like language and terminology, because, you know, we're all very good at, you know, making up words or acronyms and whatever that we may know what they mean. But, you know, our experts by experience really just, you know, what are you talking about? Talking plain English, you know, just tell us what it is that you want. Um, and, and that really is, a, you know, a real good check for us. It keeps us focused and grounded on the actual aim and the purpose of the project, because sometimes you can get swept away with all the other bits and pieces. So for me, they're really good at drilling me back to what it is exactly that we want to achieve. Thanks, Sam. Is anyone else on the panel want to talk about why co-production is important? I think from a sort of network enabler perspective, I think just going on the back of what Sam said, it's really important that we allow people to have a voice. Um, you know, so often, um, as is the case for a lot of, you know, people who come together, um, some voices can be sort of drowned out by the more loud voices. Um, and it's important that, you know, they're able to, you know, share their ideas in a very safe environment um, and to allow everyone to sort of um, contribute to the discussion. So we try to facilitate that as far as possible. Thank you. Our next discussion topic is around creative inclusive spaces. And Dave, do you want to go first on this? Okay, so yeah, so I guess the first thing is why an inclusive space and, you know, you really want people to be engaged and open about their experiences and feel they can be themselves and can voice their opinion freely. So, that, so I guess the most important thing is that participants have a sense of ownership and belonging, that it's their space. So it's really important that any space that's constructed is, is not just constructed for people by professionals, but constructed with them and by them. So it becomes they have ownership of it. And as some said, people are more likely then to engage longer term because it's theirs. It's not something they go to. It's something they're front of. And I guess, you know, obviously, and Sam will talk about some of the ways that the Age of Experience group was set up. But, you know, you have ground rules, facilitate ground rules that enable respectful interactions, um, positive use of language that allows different opinions. And so those opinions are met um, and are listened to, but not, you know, just not just challenged or dismissed. Um, so people are open to different opinions and I guess another thing to do is think about where meetings take place so not just physical accessibility um, so um, you know are the ramps are the hearing loops uh, for people that might have impairments but also distances traveled for people as well and the times that people might be traveling but also the psychological access of a space as well obviously you know going through a door is, is, is always a barrier so the more uh, open a space can be so is a religious venue open to everybody that might not have religious affiliation for instance so you really think through the space as well and how people meet um, is really important as I say Sam can talk about some of the specifics for the age of experience group and how that was set up uh, and how that's a really inclusive space. And we've got um, Hannah, since you are the network enabler for our Aging Better Citywide Hub, um, have, you have, have you got any learning to share around that when it comes to community groups? Yeah, I mean, so like Dave was saying, it's really important that we create that safe space for people to come together and share those ideas. But with that, obviously, comes people with lots of different opinions, lots of different sort of backgrounds, um, interpretations on life and, and what they would like to bring to the table. Um, this obviously can pose a bit of a problem um, if everybody wants to be heard at the same time. Um, so it's 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 allowing that to um to, to, to flow quite organically but there have been situations where um, individuals have come together and they've you know strongly disagreed and we can't actually meet a resolution so in that sense we have to make sure that you know people are 
each given a chance to talk and then we can come to sort of a, an agreement on what you know a, a, a joined sort of effort into understanding what it is that we're trying to achieve as a whole um so that can that has posed uh, you know some problems in the past but we've managed to kind of you know with the ground rules set that in place and ensure that people have um a say I, generally speaking people normally come together for a common cause and you can you know make that space available to people i think what what has sort of um, arisen as a result of the pandemic, for example, are some very socioeconomic sort of differences with people. And it's raised issues around sort of mental health, um, different disabilities. So there was a gentleman, for example, who had, um, who had a hearing impairment and he felt that the activity which was proposed by the rest of the group didn't cater for his need. Um, so that was a real sort of, um, Kind of thing that really kind of spoke to us and, and made us realize actually we really need to look deeper into the needs of the group um, and not just the sort of um desire of the the, the wider sort of um scope if you like thanks uh dave do you want to add on to that yeah i was just going to say so i think it's really important it's, it's really important people are heard but then if if their opinions and um, their insight has changed something, it's really important that that's fed back as well. So they're not just heard that those those opinions are acted upon uh, and then that's evidenced back to them. So they know that, that their, their, their time is having an impact. Absolutely. And we try to we try to do that as far as possible. That's why um, setting up a community group does take time to ensure that. Um, like you said, Dave, that people are heard and that actually it's acted upon. We're not just saying, OK, we hear you, but we're going to continue with our own agenda. We have to make sure that everybody um, has a fair say in, in, in how the group is going to move forward. And that can be challenging. It can be very challenging at times, but we, we, we more or less get there in the end. Thanks. And um, Hannah, you mentioned ground rules there. I think Angela, as a member of the Age of Experience group, our uh, experts by experience. Do you want to talk a little bit about the barriers that you or members have faced and how how you or all the members have overcome those barriers as part of that group? Well, I joined the um, group. I, I wasn't aware of the group until somebody told me about it. And I'm mainly involved um, with the group from the Carers Hub. And it was somebody that used to work there that told me about it. And she thought that my experience might be uh, valuable. So um, I went to one of the meetings and I went to uh, the first meeting, which that I went to was at Camel Croft, which is a retirement village for older people. Um, and it's very nice, very open and, you know, very comfortable. And we had the first meeting there and there's quite a few people there in the, in the hall where we were meeting and we were around little tables and, um, they did start off by telling us about the ground rules and most meetings that's what happens they discuss the ground rules and things about respect and um, others and language and diversity and um, things like that really so they told us all about that and on the whole once it's said it's respected um, I found that everybody uh, there has respected it um, we also have uh, meetings there. Well, we used to have meetings there before the lockdown, rather. Um, and we have various speakers and they also respect uh, the ground rules. Um, we did have uh, one occasion and this wasn't um, a face to face meeting. This was during lockdown and we had Zoom and we did have one uh, uh, invited guest speaker who used language, I presume she wasn't aware of the ground rules, but I would have thought that she would have been uh, as she did talks at various places. And she did use language that, um, that anybody would find unacceptable. And I have to say that it was picked up and dealt with straight away. I did address it with her, but she wasn't, um, she didn't seem to be aware of what she was saying was a problem. Uh, but I did address it with Sam and uh, people further on uh, in Aging Better. And I have to say, they addressed it very, very well. So uh, as regards ground rules, if anything is said, um, it is picked up straight away and dealt with. Whereas in some organisations, um, it can be left and 
things just sort of dwindle apart. And I think it brings the group together uh, when people know that things aren't left. So from the perspective of ground rules um, and respect and diversity, yes, that's what we need more of in, in, you know, in all the groups and any future organisations that are set up out of this. Sam, have you got anything to add on that about the, the group and the sort of barriers to, to sort of joining the group or taking part? Um, yeah, I mean, just in, you know, to tag on really the ground rules. So one of the things that we do with the ground rules is that we do let the participants have an input in the ground rules. So the ground rules weren't something that I or my predecessor set up and we said, this is what you must abide by. It wasn't a charter like that. It were, you know, we had a conversation as a group, you know, what kind of ground rules would you like, you know, what kind of group do you want to come to? Um, and the ground rules are refreshed as well. Quite often and new members to the group have the opportunity to see the ground rules and to add to them if they want to, or to question them if they want to, because it's really important as well that we, you know, we keep it fresh and relevant. And sometimes like in life in general, you kind of get maybe a little bit stuck in a rut if you've been doing something a set way. It takes someone sometimes with fresh eyes to say, well, actually, you know, that rule's a little bit outdated now. It's not really very relevant. How about we, you know, we look at it like that? So it's a constant, you know, ongoing process and a constant conversation with the group of experts. And I think that's what makes it, it work and it makes it successful. And like Angela said, because they are listened to, you know, it's not just, I don't just sit there and tick and say, oh, yeah, thanks, Angela, and tick it off and that's it. We actually, you know, action um, and, you know, really try and make the changes um, because it's their group at the end of the day. Um, and it needs to be somewhere that they feel safe, comfortable, confident. That's great. And I'm going to post in the chat now to everybody some learning from Aging Better in Birmingham around overcoming barriers to joining activities. There are more learning uh, briefings and reports on our website, agingbetterinbirmingham.co.uk under our resource page. But that's one that's sort of relevant to, especially what Hannah was talking around when it comes to community groups as well. So thinking about barriers to participate, have we got any examples of what barriers we've faced in Birmingham and how you've overcome them? I think, Angela, you got a couple of words on this. Yes, I think um, with the barriers, um, uh, access sometimes can be um, a big problem for some people. Uh, where, we, where we used to meet um, was uh, fine uh, because it was centralised, um, more or less centralised, uh, the building where we met. And if we do meet at... Um, at uh, the uh, Aging Better or BBSC offices. That's uh, in the centre of town in Digba. And that can be difficult to get to. And I personally don't like driving into a busy city um, because I could be driving around all day and then we've got parking issues. So we're fortunate in that we've been able to have, um, for those that need it uh, or are not on the bus route, taxis um, that have been provided for us. So we're fortunate in that respect, which again, enables us to get involved and join in whatever uh, is going on there. So um, that's, we've managed to overcome that barrier. Um, the, the other barriers sometimes can be terminology. Um, if you're in a group and, uh, you know, they've met and whatever, there's certain things in terminology that you wouldn't, or abbreviations that I personally wouldn't understand because I'm not uh, there every day working uh, there every day so terminology can be an issue as well but I have to say um, it's a learning experience not just a barrier it's a learning experience because if I do ask if I'm not sure what it is I can comfortably ask and it will be explained without you know any kind of uncomfortable feeling so um, those, are the, those are the two things that I um, have found that you know could be a barrier if you let it. That's great, thank you. And how about Sam? Do you want to add anything on that? And then we'll move on to David and Hannah if you want to add a cup, anything at all as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. So like Angela said, you know, there can be a number of, you know, of barriers. So social anxiety right through to lack of resources. Um, so we try and overcome those barriers. And um, by like Dave said at the beginning, offering training sessions to people so that they can gain the confidence to take part and to sit on, you know, certain panels and take part in the full programme of opportunities um, that we have available. Um, also, I think communication is really key. So clear guidance and regular communication and ensuring that, you know, the experts know what's expected of them, but in return, what they can expect from us. So what they can expect from me, you know, right, you can expect that I will be in touch with you regularly for this. I am at the end of the phone. This is my email address. Um, so having those open channels of communication um, and being there for people in a variety of different different ways different people have different needs as well so it's about from my point of view being aware of those needs you know some people an email won't work so if it's an opportunity say for Friday and you need I need the only way I can get that opportunity to them is via letter that person unfortunately is not going to be able to take part in that opportunity because the post just isn't going to get there in time so it's about managing those expectations um, as well like Angela said, yeah, we do provide transport as part of the of the program. So people in the co-production cohort are offered a taxi service that they're welcome to take um, to get them to and from program opportunities. Um, also refreshments and lunch, because also those kind of things, as well as overcoming a barrier, they're also like it's a bit of a nice thing as well, because we, you know, you've got to remember people are giving up their valuable time, you know, for, for nothing, you know, they're not getting any, it's not a job. For them like it is for us they're not getting that monetary out of it so it's nice to be able to offer people some nice cakes and you know a nice lunch and to you know to give something back I think it's really important that it's it's a two-way street you know they're, they're giving to us so we need to find a way to give back in a way that's meaningful for them um, and it often makes me smile because when we do meet a lot of things and in fact in this digital environment we found ourselves in the thing that people miss most after seeing each other is the lunch that we have at Panel Craft again. Like when when can we meet again and have the chips and the sandwiches? Because that's their, that's their time then when they socialise and they really enjoy that that aspect. So you know, investing a little bit in you know the nice things and like Angela said, getting a nice venue. You know, don't just go for a, a community centre because it's it's cheap. You know, think about where it's located. Is there other stuff that goes on there? Because sometimes people stay at Panel Craft and take part in other activities after the meeting ends. They make new friends. So, you know, it's, it's, there's got to be something. Think about what your participants are getting out of that meeting as well, not just yourselves. That's great. And Angela, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, I found that um, when we um, when we uh, apply for funding, um, one barrier can be that the, the application form, um, I think most people have said it, it can be an issue. Most groups have, have mentioned that and brought it up several times. Um, to uh, access funding. The access of it isn't, isn't a problem, but it's just the application form, uh, really. But uh, having said that, you are, or we are able to get uh, support from um, the community, le the leaders, the hub leaders uh, there. So we are able to get access to that. Um, the only other thing is that some of the questions on the form, I think uh, some people found um, a little bit difficult to answer or a little bit uncomfortable to answer and that probably is a generational thing um, as well so perhaps if it's worded slightly differently or sometimes is it really necessary um, could be one thing that perhaps could be looked at. Thanks that brings us really nicely into the next part actually so was there anything that um, you felt become became apparent in terms of barriers during the course of the program and how did we address those barriers and I think we can talk a little bit about the monitoring and the evaluation that we've done as part of Aging Better in Birmingham and all the Aging Better programs and uh, we've done sort of national evaluation and local evaluation and part of the funding that Angela is talking about our micro fund uh, a requirement of that was to sort of engage with our evaluation forms and that was that was a bit tricky um, as Angela mentioned as well uh, both around people being uncomfortable to give certain information away about themselves um, some of the questions was around people's loneliness uh, and the levels of how much they engage with other people so uh, over to you Hannah uh, or Dave 
So I was just going to add as well, maybe it's more going back to an earlier point about groups and how welcoming they should be. Mm -hmm. um, so say, for instance, if it's an established group, um, I, this isn't just for older people, this is for anybody. Walking into an established group can be really daunting. So I think one of the things Age of Experience does really well is it kind of um, interviews people first, prepares them for what they're going to be walking into, and then buddies, buddies new people with established group members. So people aren't just thrown into a new group dynamic, which can feel, even if it's not clear, you can feel cliquey if you're an outsider so I think that's really important as well to be mindful that um, yeah people might you know if they've got anxiety they might really struggle with it with an established group uh, back to the point we were discussing now um, I think that that's an inherent tension isn't it between um, community development on the ground and how regular people go about everyday business and systems and processes that might be put in place so particularly this was a uh, long-term uh, research project essentially aging better has been so that kind of uh, the forms and the research element of it um, could be a barrier to people participating on any number of levels so it's really how that's done is really important and and i guess the most important thing from aging best point of view is it was always optional you know filling out the form was optional um but it, again as angela said it could still be a barrier to people participating so it's really important to think about how you put those processes in place and how you approach people to uh, participate in them um I, I think hannah will probably have some more things to say about that as well yeah, I mean, the, the, the questionnaire process has always been sort of a bone of contention for our groups from the very start. Um, <clears throat> and it was something that we did, you know, feedback to the, to the main team. But unfortunately, it's, you know, it's one of those things that we have to do. We have to gather that sort of information um, and, you know, sort of critical data that we need to sort of have an understanding of the types of people that we're that we're meeting and also to ensure that the, the program itself is achieving what it's set out to achieve, which is to ultimately reduce isolation um, in the older community. Um, but yes, that did pose um, an issue for many of our groups. Uh, like Angela said, some of the questions were considered to be quite intrusive or meddlesome. Not, you know, many people did comment on, you know, why do I have to answer these specific questions? Um, you know, I just want to come along to a group and enjoy a chat and a cup of coffee. Um, I think in that sense, then it was incumbent on us as the network enablers who were, you know, supporting that group and facilitating the groups to, to explain the, the importance of uh, the CMF and the evaluation process. Um, and like Dave said, even though it was, um, you know, it wasn't mandatory, um, I think it was important to, for people to really understand why we wanted that information. And on the back of that, you know, many people did decide to, to fill that out. I don't think it quite took into account um, different levels of, of need, the disabilities, Many people just even struggle to hold a pen just to fill out the application. It does take about five minutes. Um, and some of the questions, how they were phrased as well, weren't particularly clear. Um, so it did it did mean that we had to sort of uh, bring others in to either interpret some of the questions for people or to even answer the, the, the questionnaires for them on their behalf, obviously with their consent. Um, but overall, this is something that we make very clear at the start before any group apply for funding. Um, you know, there is a questionnaire process. There is an evaluation process which we would kindly ask you to participate in. Do you have any issues with that? Um, and, you know, more often than not, people would um, comply and help us out with that. Thanks. We've had a question from Renisa Ines. I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, she has two questions, actually. One of them is, in terms of all the people being part of the co-production process, what are some examples of the tasks that they carried out? Who wants to answer that? Angela. Sorry, I've, I've, I muted you. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, we've, we've had the opportunity to get involved as much or as little as, as you want to. So I've been involved with things like test and learning. So that's um, constant evaluation of how um, Aging Better BBSC are doing. I've also had the opportunity to get involved in uh, when people are applying for funding, perhaps to develop, um, for example, Tyburn area and people have put their bids in 
uh, organisations rather put their bids in and uh, look at these organisations to see what they can do and are they not just there to develop the area but to develop it for older people so I've been able to use my skills and experience there to say well you know uh, what are you doing about this and what are you doing about that type of thing really so I've had that, um, quite a bit of you know experience and opportunities to get involved with who's uh, eventually access, accessing funding and um, various things as, as we've been going along throughout the pandemic as well to uh, develop uh, community areas and small funding as well as large funding. So I've had quite a bit of an uh, opportunity to get involved from that perspective. So um, yes, I think uh, from an older person, I may not look it, but from an older person perspective, uh, yes, I've had the opportunity to say, well, I don't think my knees would cope with that one. <laughs> yes, so yes, quite involved. David. So just to say, so I was interviewed and there were older people on the recruitment panel, which is great. And also I ran a procurement process and older people were involved in that procurement process from start to finish, including being on interview panels for prospective um, uh, providers as well. So uh, really varied things that people were. Sam. Yeah, um, just to like clear as well, it's, you know, there are real, uh, you know, big opportunities like Andrew said about fun pan and I said about recruitment, but there are also like, smaller opportunities as well so we have people who are involved in you know maybe not less important I don't want to say that but ones that maybe don't seem as daunting so like to invite someone to be on an interview panel for instance you will only get a select certain people who feel confident to do that but then there are people who want to contribute to the newsletter for instance or want to send a video sharing their experience so there's a real like wide variety of opportunities that people can be involved in. We, under normal circumstances, we host an annual event in Birmingham City Centre, which is usually attended by over 100 people across the city. Um, and the experts have the opportunity to get involved in that. So where, where is the venue? What kind of activities are we going to have? Do you want to be on the registration desk on the day? You know, so there's really, from really small parts to really big parts, so like Angela said, they can get involved in as many or as you know as few opportunities um, as they want and as I get to know them individually I can then tailor the opportunities to meet their needs so I know the kind of things that Angela would be interested in um, so when I have those kind of opportunities I kind of have a list of people that I would go to first so that we're targeting the right people all the time as well. Uh, Hannah did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say from a sort of delivery perspective, I mean, ageing better groups, it, it's, our focus has always been about facilitating older people to, to become very independent with their choices and to form groups which um, are sort of community led completely in their nature. So that means us taking a step back and allowing those older people to fill out the application, decide amongst themselves what resources they need, what support they need going forward. Um, but it's all about um, giving them the, the, the sort of authority, if you like, to, to make that decision themselves, which is crucial to what Aging Better is all about. And I just want to add as well, so we've had quite a few campaigns running as part of the programme. One of them was a quite high profile one called Aging with Pride. Uh, it was led by LGBT um, Centre in Birmingham and they had uh, a part of our experts also take part in not only the process of procuring that, but also delivering the campaign and taking part in videos and talking about their experiences. Uh, and sort of advising around it and it's been the same around a podcast that we've sort of produced which talks about people's experiences around certain um, themes such as LGBT and housing for example uh, and we've also had sort of marketing campaigns around neighbourliness and those have been developed by people over 50 uh, so they've had the sort of um, word in around what works, what type of things would work in terms of reaching people in the city, um, what type of language to be used, the name of the campaign, uh, as well as the type of imagery, uh, you know, making sure we're not sh just portraying people with sort of grey hand canes, <laughs> that's, that's not what all the people look like, so... 
Um, there's another question, which is, um, how else can we encourage BAME older people to join during recruitment? Have we got any answers around that or ideas or experiences from Birmingham? Um, I'll go. I think it's, again, like we've discussed, it's about, you know, having an open policy. So the Age of Experience group is a very open group, you know, and we do, we welcome people from, from all backgrounds. And in fact, when I took on the role, um, as again, from the outside coming in, I noticed that from my, in my opinion, it wasn't an overly diverse group at the time when I took on the position. Um, so that's something that I really tried to to push forward to make it a more diverse group that was better reflecting, you know, the citizens of Birmingham. Um, so it was a case of talking to the network enablers. So, you know, Hannah and her colleagues and explaining where the gaps were in the age of experience group and did they know people in the community um, and what could I do to make that more accessible to, you know, should I have a one-to-one -one meeting with them? Should I take a member of the group along to meet them so that they can understand that actually it's not quite as scary as you, you you might think it is, you know, it is, you know, it's a bit of fun, um, you know, it's not all serious, you know, we do have a good time and we do have a laugh. Um, but, and also getting them to come, like Angela said, they're all, everyone's always invited if you show interest, you're invited to attend a meeting and, you know, nothing's expected of you, you just literally just have to turn up, soak up the atmosphere, get introduced to people and kind of find your feet. Um, and then after that, I follow that up then with, how did you feel, you know, what could we do to make it better, you know, what works for you if you don't want to join the group, why do you not want to join the group, is there something particular that you experience, you know, that, that we can change. Um, but yeah, I think it's around like cultural awareness as well and understanding, like Dave said, about where your venue is, is it going to cause upset, what kind of topics do you talk about, and making sure that people just really understand the purpose and the point of, you know, why they should be involved in this group, and that's where the long-standing experts are real champions of that because they'll speak really passionately about why you should be in but you know they probably say, why wouldn't you be involved no like, this is a great thing to be involved in um and that's what we've used over the years instead of it coming from me coming from the experts already embedded because they can shout about it and you know fully explain to people much better and then they build up that relationship so they're not going into an empty room where they don't know anybody because they've had a conversation with Angela before so already they've got that connection. Angela, have you got something to say on that? Yes, I'd like to say that, um, I mean, I don't know what happens in other cities, but in Birmingham, I feel that it's successful. And I think the reason why it's successful is because people go back to the meetings, the age of experience meeting, they want to go back. And the reason that you want to go back or we want to go back to the next meeting and the next one is the next one because we feel comfortable and we feel welcomed. And also there's, it's just such a variety. There's a variety of speakers. And if, for example, um, I said, well, it would be good to see if you could get somebody that can talk about X or Y subject, you know that that will be done at some point or other, that, that you know, research will be done to find those kind of speakers that can talk about subjects that are useful and interesting for us as older people or you know a group or whatever so from that perspective it's good but also um going to the age of experience people have an opportunity there's a wide range of opportunities there there's opportunities um, to find out about health and well-being um you're very well supported as i say by the various hubs and also you can interlink. So it's almost like a little directory. We're going and there's a little directory where you can find out who, I mean, I've, I've done it with Hannah's directory, <clears throat> Hannah's area. Just find out who may, do, who people know that can help with certain bits and pieces. So we have our little connection groups there for various things um, outside really. And um, from the age of experience group again, I've been able to go to uh, one of the national events, um, which was a couple of weeks ago, a couple of years ago, sorry, before the lockdown. And I went to the Sheffield meeting and everything was arranged for me to be able to access that meeting uh, comfortably. And at the meeting, it was very, very interesting. And also to find out what different people or different regions 
are doing there and what we can learn and also what they could learn from us. Um, as a result of that meeting, I managed to meet uh, somebody from another area um, just uh, by London. And um, I still keep in touch with that person today. Uh, somebody that I would never have met, just got talking to. Uh, we had the same thing, which was age of experience and what we're doing within it. And I still keep in touch with her today, almost three years later. So we both got that experience and we talk about it all the time. So there's an opportunity, not just to meet each other in the group, which was on a monthly basis, but to meet people further afield if you want to. It's there. That's great. Hannah. Yeah, I just thought it was worth noting. I mean, obviously, the, the last year has, um, with the crisis, with the pandemic, it's really sort of exposed the fragility and uh, the inequalities amongst people. Um, and some of our groups have really um, began to, to, to focus on that. So we have... Um, we have a, one group in particular, which is predominantly made up of the BAME community, and um, they reacted quite strongly to the Black, Black Lives uh, movement, um, which kind of raised all sorts of issues around, you know, race inequality. But not only that, it threw up issues around, you know, domestic abuse, um, ageism mental health, um, lots of stigmas. Um, so they're now refocusing their, um, their, their own delivery on sort of addressing all of these issues within their communities. Um, so hopefully that will encourage more people to come forward who do feel like they're unable to, to talk about those things or perhaps feel stigmatized. Um, uh, so it's been a real sort of move in the right direction to, to addressing those really important life altering things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to note, we've got a few more minutes left. We've, we've said we're going to continue a little bit with a Q&A afterwards, but if anyone has any questions, um, if you could click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and if you don't know how to do that, you can raise your hand by clicking on reactions or on the raise hands, and I will ask you to speak when the time comes. Um, I think for now we haven't got any more questions. So I've got a question for the panel. Um, is there anything in particular that you feel worked well and anything you feel like we could have done better? And I think Angela, you may have something on this. Yes, yes. Um, I, think, um, I think perhaps what perhaps could have been done better is, uh, I mean, it's all sort of like looking at it now, um, you know, we're, we're coming towards the end, but perhaps what could have been done better is um, going to the age of experience meetings and other meetings, I don't see uh, a variety of ethnic, uh, mo ethnic minority people uh, within the organisation. So, um, and I know it's been a struggle to get certain groups together so we don't see uh, a lot we don't well I don't know if there are any groups that are um, black male groups for example or other ethnic minority groups um, I don't see a lot of that and I think that may be representative of the fact that aging better doesn't have doesn't employ a lot of black men I personally haven't seen it um, uh, I don't know what their ethnic uh, uh, group how it's made up but I don't see that and because of that perhaps that's one of the reasons why we can't seem to target um, those groups that you want to uh, ask, try to help and support either so I think going forward um, if that could be looked at if you're trying to target certain groups uh, you need to get the you know the same uh, within the staff the staffing level really need to be in inclusive of that um, I think uh, technology as well is uh, a big thing for me because I'm not technical or mechanical at all, but I have to say that um, I've had a lot of support uh, from Aging Better as regards that. I did have a laptop that was uh, in the spare room in a corner somewhere and I found it, but uh, didn't know how to use it really. And um, with joining the meetings during the lockdown, I wasn't uh, originally able to do that. I could only do it as and when by phone. And as people know, if they have to phone in, 
that that can be quite difficult because the phone, uh, the battery doesn't last very long because it uses a lot of battery and it uses a lot of your digital uh, power as well. So it was, was becoming quite expensive. And I did feel a little bit um, that I was left behind really there. But fortunately, um, I was offered a dongle. I think Sam or somebody probably thought, well, you know, let's see what we can do for Angela. And I personally was offered a dongle. I know other people have been offered various kinds of support. Um, and that has helped me. And here I am today. I would never have thought that I would be sitting here Zooming. That's another thing I'd, ne I'd never heard of before COVID was Zoom. So, um, yeah, so from that perspective, yes. But uh, yes, as regards volunteers and who you've got in the hubs, uh, that sort of thing, I think if it could have been more diverse, the staffing and the volunteers, I think that would have uh, perhaps enabled us to get a, a bigger variety, uh, target the, your client group. I think those are really good points, Angela. I think, Dave, maybe you have some points about that, especially around our work in Sparkbrook. Yeah, I, th I think some of it's around, I, I, I think the group's incredibly diverse on one level, but it tends to be, I think the makeup is more uh, female than male. And I think there's something around why and how men uh, volunteer and participate in voluntary activity compared to women. So may need to be looked at. And I think Angela's right around role modeling. It's really important to have people that look like you, um, engaging with you. Um, and I suppose BVSC does have uh, black male board members and black male members of staff. They just don't work on the Age and Better program. So again, I guess there's something around role modeling. And, and I mean, it, we do have Sparkbrook Hobbies kind of um, community led and does reflect that, that community. But again, they didn't engage out of Sparkbrook, which kind of um, diluted the diversity of the group on some level, which is a shame. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of it really. I mean, as I say, um, you, you've got to change. If, if the process isn't working, you have to change it. And that's what we did with Sparkbrook really and set that kind of group up independently. But, you know, that worked in the sense of it, got those voices out of Sparkbrook and they could join the conversation but they weren't in the room having a conversation with the other people and as Angela said that's sometimes where the interesting things happen when people network I mean community development is about relationships and working with communities about relationships and the best way to form relationships is to be in the room with people um, so on one level it, it worked in Sparkbrook that we could get people's voices to um, feed into the, the broader conversation but it's a shame they couldn't be around other people around their peers in the room with them because I think that would have really strengthened the group um, yeah so the kind of it worked it didn't work on, on one level Definitely. I've noticed that we've got Vimla in the group. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk. So, Vimla, have you got anything to add in terms of um, sort of how you've taken part in Age of Experience group or anything around um, barriers to participation and what, what your experience have been? You're on mute, though, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Hi. Your question, please. Well, if you had anything that you wanted to contribute around sort of um, your experience of being part of the Age of Experience group and any barriers or any things that you've seen was a barrier, but that was then sort of uh, how, how that was overcome as part of the program or your experience with that. Can I ask one question? Please. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Dave and then Alina, if you could answer my question, please. When Dave started his uh, talk, he started with the Birmingham is a city of migrants. My only simple question is, people, those who come here to live, work, and uh, spend their lives, do, we, do they always stay migrants or do they become citizens eventually? Just to clarify, I meant the city is built on people that come here. 
and I just use that term, and that's historic as well as contemporary. So the city's history is one of migration to it, and that's what I meant by that. And I know that's quite a loaded term, so apologies if it's come across in the wrong way, but I I, 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 I'm the child of migrants and I feel I belong here, so yeah. So do I. So uh, that is sometimes, you know, no matter how hard people try, at the end of the day, they are migrants. That's just, I didn't mean to uh, hurt anyone. I was just a little curious to know. Now, my experience with the age of experience, my participation on my involvement has been quite uh, valuable to me. And I think I have contributed as well to the group. Thanks, Vimla. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna have to stop us there because we are running out of time and people are quickly leaving. So I know people have other meetings to go to. So I just want to say thank you to our panelists for coming today and for sharing your experiences. Hopefully, people have found this. Anyone who's attended, you found some learning from here that you thought was useful. If you do have any questions, you can stay on for a couple of minutes, but um, and we'll answer those uh, as well. And if you don't, you you are free to leave. <laughs> Thank you.